Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Reverend Andy Lindley and this morning we'll be digging further into Phyllis Tickle's book The Great Emergence and her description of the Reformation and of the uh, changes that have taken place in the last decades of our own experience. But first, let's pray. Parent God, we gather as your family, generations together, sharing your word, sharing in this time of worship. We share our faith as we find our story within the story of your people, our identity as part of an ever-changing landscape that is your world. Between us we can recount many stories, draw on years of experience, and yet it is a drop in the ocean of that which you have witnessed and shaped. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. We know the blessings of those who fought for freedom, those who studied and explored, and those who have sought your heart and lived lives worthy of your calling. Lord, may we today take our place in that story of love and becoming. May we experience for ourselves your glory, your wonder and grace, your love in this place. And may we reflect it and share it through the lives we live. Amen. Romans 12, 1-2 Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We finished our last talk with Phyllis's jumble sale, her rummage sale, and her assertion that the upheavals, although tumultuous in the Christian faith, were in fact a blessing that broadened and deepened it. Together today we're going to look in more detail at how she arrived at these conclusions, focusing down on the changes that shaped the Reformation, and likewise the changes she sees as shaping the great emergence as we are now experiencing it. Although we attribute the start of the Great Reformation to Luther with his nailing down of the treaties to the church door in 1517, most people agree the seeds of change began to be sown as early as 1378. In that year, both France and Italy elected a Pope, Urban VI was the Italian Pope and Clement VII the French Pope, and they waged war, they, a war that had its roots in social and political issues, probably more so than religious ones. By 1418, it was even worse, there were three popes, two Italians, Gregory XII and John XXIII, and the French one, Benedict XIII. For the person in the pew, the question that obviously arose from this, given the pope was the source of all authority, was who now speaks for God? Where exactly is authority to be found? And the Reformation and um, Luther in a sense produced an answer, scripture and only scripture, and with it the concept of a priesthood of all believers. But of course for that to work, then people uh, re re needed to read the scripture themselves and thus with this came a thrust for education. Just to critically at this time came the invention 1440 of the printing press by Gutenberg, which placed a Bible in people's hands and gave people a way to spread the ideas that it generated. This growth in knowledge eventually led to the, <coughs> the Enlightenment, science, technology and the world we might recognise today. But a new problem emerged. Ask three people to read a piece of scripture, you get at least four versions of their interpretation. <coughs> Add to that, and scientists like Copernicus in 1543 challenged the idea the earth was the centre of the universe, again challenging the accepted stories of Christianity at the time, and so you have a heady mix. The other fuel for reformation in these ideas was warfare between Islam and Christian Europe. When in 1453 the Turks captured Constantinople, thousands of Greek Orthodox scholars, traders and intelligentsia fled to take residence in Europe and they brought with them their books, their culture and their knowledge. 
And so we end up with people like Homer and Pythagoras, Aristotle, dramas by Euclid, Demosthenes, along with Roman writers Lucretius, Cicero, Pliny and Arabic and Islamic mathematical expertise. In other words, a flood of new ideas, culture and story. Similarly, clashes of mixing of worldviews, knowledge and spirituality were taking place wherever Islam and Christianity clash, which was throughout Europe. In wake of this bloodshed, there were also societal structures taking place be between serfs and lords of the manor, and people began to experience a freedom of purpose as they moved from the country to the city, and rather than being under their constantly watching lord of the manor, became subjects of a more distant king. Money, and not land ownership or blood, blood ties, became a new basis of power. The idea of family replaced tribe. People were exploring new identities, new freedoms. And I find echoes of that uh, in the situation I encountered in places like Philip and Corinth prior to Paul's mission. There was established through repeated war and invasion and dissemination of news, new ideas, a similar melting plot of religions, gods, multiculturalism, as well as a population predominantly made up of recently freed slaves and newly retired legionaries from all over the empire. People, in other words, drowning in ideas of how to live with the new freedom to explore that living and asking and the ability to ask who and how to worship and who was their God. And so the Protestantism that emerged fueled by these very similar ideas had so many flavours from the outset but has continued to schism and divide ever since and uh, judging by the Catholics believe there are up to 9,000 variations on Protestant denominations and of course ten, tens of thousands of other variants around us too. So what about the changes that are driving uh, the great emergence as Phyllis sees it today? It might be a good point to stop the recording and share some of your own thoughts before I walk through some of the things that Phyllis has identified. So scientific progress. The scientific progress we saw during the, uh, the Reformation obviously accelerated things significantly and by 1859 we were uh, dealing with the idea of evolution from Darwin, which obviously upset the apple cart once again. Around the same period, Faraday was looking and offering new insights into matter and energy and its interchangeability. Freud and Jung were exploring the wonders of the mind. And in 1905, Einstein challenged the absolutes of time and space with special relativity. Heisenberg was unlocking the mysteries of matter and quantum theory with his uncertainty principle long held truths in other words being overturned and raising the question where is truth what is absolute truth and of course in 1969 man lands on the moon um, breaking the heavens in a very real way communications the printing press had to, uh, changed the reformation we of course have had radio in the 30s and tv in the 40s and, and the internet in the 80s with its huge access to a store of knowledge. And biologists and psychologists and neuroscientists, physicians, linguists, anthropologists, artists, physicists, philosophers, new areas of science aided by the internet have been able to share their ideas freely. And for individuals, we've increasingly curated our own content. We have personal headphones and devices that <coughs> and phones that allow us to explore this vast uh, body of knowledge but also the ability to to cocoon ourselves with those ideas that agree with us my truth in other words has become the dominant truth experts are not trusted we curate our own truth and of course the instantaneousness of communications of zoom of, of satellite tv means we don't just share joy with our fellow human beings but the immediacy of pain and hurt and war. But it's not just been these things that are changing, Christianity itself has been evolving. The quest for the historical Jesus began to 
ask questions of uh, the the real person of Jesus, and certainly the idea of a white Jesus was quickly challenged. Jesus was seen by some as guru and sage as much as God incarnate, and literary deconstruction and form criticism and people looking at the texts have uh, shown that, that it has been redacted and changed over the years, which is questioned then again its authority, its uh, its originality. Jesus' Jewish background was explored as something as a <clears throat> to help us understand his Jewishness, his the context in which he taught and which he knew himself. And revivals like the Pentecostal revival in 1906 and the, the birth of Pentecostalism and spirit focus has changed the nature of Christianity too. Alongside all this, societal structures, social structures have changed. The invention of the car literally left grandma in the rear view mirror. No longer was Sunday a gathering around the lunch table, passing on ideas and sharing family and building family ties. Instead, people began to go shopping, to go, to go on days out, to play sport. Sunday evening services disappeared. Saturday evenings were invented to free up Sundays. Um, Karl Marx was looking at creation as part of a great absolute that was becoming and governments becoming the presence of that absolute. Church kind of responded to this degradation of community by establishing itself as a stabilizing organization. So if you go around America, you'll find that churches have basketball courts, swimming pools, and of course, fellowships. And they, they really try to integrate all of life and what urbanization of the car is stripped away into their social formation and unified experience. By the 70s, though, men, young men and women were rebelling against this uniformity and sterility. And over time, many were seeing themselves as spiritual, but not religious. At the time, time things that made changes in people's lives, like Alcoholics Anonymous, were inviting people to choose their own concept of God. And still people were being helped, even though they weren't looking to the God that they should, maybe. The authority of scripture alone, the, the Protestant kind of cry, uh, was being eroded, eroded by experience really. The civil war took place but the Bible hadn't condemned slavery. The strict teaching on divorce led to carnage and when the church opened itself to divorce clergy there was questioning about that. The ordination of women was a, a dilemma for some, the equality of the sexes, abortion, uh, the treatment of people who are LGBTQ, all brought questions to bear on how Christianity, how the Bible was being interpreted and how it was being lived out. And a, a lack of valuing of how the Bible was to assist on this has led to a growing scriptural ignorance and moving away from it. And a more positive change too in the midst of this, a, a growing openness to ecumenism and interfaith dialogue for some. Um, perhaps diluted the Christian message. Other cultural changes have taken place, waves of immigration. Um, for the Americans, 1964, immigrants came with ideas about Buddhism and that brought tools to explore the inner world of self without the trappings of theism and belief in a God. Future waves would bring other new ideas, new cultures and wider and broader spiritualities. Drugs in the 1960s offered mind-altering experiences, still do, but their response to them often gave people religious, uh, religiously framed ecstatic experiences. Medical uh, technology and science advanced and life was prolonged and the ability to, for science to heal began to dominate over the idea of faith healing. And in our global economy, the Reformation, cash was king, now, arguably, information is more important than even cash or blood. And so many industries are taking place that are gleaning our information and hoarding it. And of course, with the internet, religious exploration, teaching the experience is happening online without the kind of uh, tempering belonging to a community that might offer some diversity. The family itself has reconfigured with the pill and equal rights and a decline in people opting to marry, uh, families have a very different shape. And with the, with, uh, 
work and with the car people often live far from family networks making that that link back to the the family networks and story sharing even more thin families have just been shaped considerably and so questions in the final section we'll, we will look forward as to how individual Christians have responded to these changes in the last few decades but for now I wonder which of the things uh, that I've shared have been most significant for you whether they've been positive or negative did the things that impacted your faith negatively improve your life and vice versa did you ever find yourself seeking to resist this tide were you the, swiss, the fish that swims the opposite way as some of the uh, images of the Christian faith suggest and if we see changes at the Reformation as being a positive one for us as Protestants, but some of the drivers for that negative, how do we respond to Paul's letter to the Romans? How do we resist the world? How do we discern the way forward? Lord, we've spent some time today reflecting on the ways in which cultural, social and psychological change unfolds. The link between our faith, our spirituality and the way we live our lives as your disciples. We may yearn to maintain, to secure, to hold fast to what is comfortable, but our comfort was bought through others' willingness to be transformed, our status quo purchased through the refining fires of change and heartache. Lord, we're only human. Guide us that when, when we should resist the tide of the world, we do so with courage. And when we should embrace such change as a means to challenge our broken image of you, then let us do that with courage too. And give us grace when we make the wrong decisions. Amen.